Fires. Welcome back, everyone. We will now begin the very exciting fireside chat session, Crest and Truffs in the handloom sector. If there is one brand in India that is symbolic of Indian handlooms and committed to building the Indian handloom story, it is Fab India. As the country's largest platform for handmade products, the session will trace the efforts of Fab India at the linking at linking weavers and craftsways rural producers to the urban markets. It is my privilege to invite Ms. Jaya Jaitley. Ms. Jaitley has an intimate knowledge of the craft traditions of India, having worked in the field for over 40 years. She's considered a leader and expert in this field. In 1986, she founded an association of craftspeople called the Dastakari Hat Samiti, which enables traditional workers to gain confidence in the marketplace through many innovative strategies. Her work in bringing together craftspeople of many countries in design workshops is seen as a major contribution towards soft power diplomacy. She's a prolific writer and has published books uh, on revival of crafts and handlooms in the India. Welcome, ma'am. I you, now too. warmly welcome Mr. William Nanda Bissell. William Nanda Bissell, the chairman of Fab India, has steered the company's retail growth and product diversification for over the last two years. One of the India's most successful contemporary lifestyle retail chains, Fab India is known for its focus on the craft-based products, creating job opportunities and generating livelihoods in the craft sector across the country. It, is, it has been particularly successful in bridging the rural urban divide, creating access to urban markets for rural-based artisans working with traditional skills. Welcome, sir, and welcome, ma'am. I now hand over the session to Ms. Jaya Jaitley, and she can take forward the conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for getting us both together. Um, I have to start with a little bit of shared autobiographies, I think, in the sense that uh, I'm a whole big fat generation older than William, because I was a very, like to call myself a close friend of his father. And I saw him coming to India and settling in. And so from that time, we've been friends. I Even when I studied in the US, um, I went to his grandparents' home and I've had a meal with them. And I somehow feel the association is far beyond handicrafts and handlooms and the love of the craftsperson. It's a, it's a, it really is a family relationship, although maybe we don't meet that often. And um, I also want to, I'm sure William would do the same, honor the fact that uh, John Bissell gave this institution a name that is unmatchable. The whole idea of it being called Fab India is one of the best brand names even before branding, packaging, logo, and all these things came into fashion. And the idea of combining in one's mind the idea of fabric and fabulous and India kind of has carried us through right from then to now to all those who are proud of this sector and these traditions of India. So I want to salute John Bissell for that and for William to really carrying that on so beautifully. But I think both of us have to acknowledge what a very sound foundation your father gave to you and to this company that is serving so many people now. So having said that, how much have you really absorbed of what he really wanted? Can you, from your side, talk about your father's vision and what did he see and what do you think is the core of what you've carried on from that? And how much of what he wanted have you realized and how far have you on your own, with your own thinking, gone ahead. Because that really shows the growth of a wonderful seed into a wonderful garden. And uh, I hope that that's what we can call what you've done now. So I ask you now to respond to some of these. Something will be nostalgic, sentimental, but also telling us of how you've grown. Thank you, Jaya. Um, actually, uh, I realize that it's it's been a three generational friendship because growing up, I used to hear about your mother, Mrs. Chitur. And so I realized it's been a three generational friendship because 
uh, I know your son and, and uh, I hope, you know, uh, my children and, and your grandchildren also continue that. So, but thank you for that. You know, I remember when I um, first started, I, I was shown a craft map of India and um, the map was prepared by um, a young designer called Sunita Kanvinde for you had commissioned it. That's right. I don't know if you remember this, but this was a very long time ago. And, and uh, do you remember this map? It was a deep... That map led to maps of every state of India, which took <laughs> over 14 years, right? Yes, I remember that. So every time a map of a state would come out, I was just struck by the enormous variety in each state. I remember when the Orissa map came out, you know, one thought of Orissa as not having many craft traditions. And then when you look at it, every district, every region, you know, I mean, the, the, just the sheer diversity from Sabai grass to scoopine to this, I mean, there were so many, so many products, you know, most people think of it as just being textile. But textile is one part of that heritage. The heritage spans, you know, from tribal art, to tribal crafts, to the lost wax process in brass to, I mean, the, the, just the span. And every time those maps came out, one was struck by the enormous, you know, the incredible heritage and the richness that there was there. And, uh, you know, and, and it's something that uh, really, if, if you hadn't brought out those very visual, beautifully visual maps, you know, if you see it in a book and it's a list, it doesn't stick in your mind the same way as, as that color and that just the way it was presented with a map of the state. Um, so my, uh, you know, Jeff, honestly, I wasn't planning to get involved uh, with Fab India. It was an export company in those days. I, I wanted to be an environmental journalist and I was doing work with some, an organization called the Center for Science and Environment. But sadly, my father has sud very suddenly fell ill and, you know, and then as it often happens in these cases, uh, you know, decisions are thrust upon you rather than, you know, one making a decision. So I thought I would get involved uh, with Fab India for a little while and then, you know, figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And then, um, so it wasn't at all on my, it wasn't something that I had planned. I had also, at the same time, I was working with the Center for Science and Environment. I was also trying to set up a leather workers uh, cooperative, which I also felt I wanted to set it up and then, you know, let them take it on from there. Uh, but, you know, life has plans, you know, we make plans and then life makes its plans for us. And, you know, <laughs> I, yeah. I thought I would be uh, an environmental journalist. That was what I had, you know, um, had my heart set on at that time. Um, but you did write a book. Yes, yes, about <laughs> the environment. So it was, uh, so that, that was what happened in, you know, when, when I realized, uh, when I got involved with the company, I, I also realized that, it was at a time where people didn't really appreciate uh, the traditions we were making. The bulk of our sales were coming from exporting to companies abroad. Those companies uh, tended to relabel the product and we were competing with machine made products uh, in a market where, you know, I remember the 90% of our exports was products that really um, were going as linens, which could easily have been made on a machine. So it wasn't really, wasn't using the genius of the country to its best effect. Uh, and the fact is, the larger the orders were, the more it lent itself to be made mechanically than, than by hand, because the orders were large and growing. So I also realized that the export business was not a good way to provide a market for what we wanted to do. And, and so, um, and at that point, interestingly enough, the company really had only one store in Greater Kailash. Mm -hmm. uh, largely 90% of the business was export, um, you know, and, and it was, and I could also see that the export business was not an area where craft would be competitive long-term because each product is different. You have to appreciate each product for its individuality. It was not mass produced. So um, with time, I, I thought that there was going to be a generation coming of age in India. Uh, and, and don't forget, this is 91 when the liberalization began in the economy. So the liberalization start, had start, which had started in 91. By the time I got involved with the business on a full-time basis, it was 98, 99. That late, was it? Yeah. And one could see that, one could see that the country was, you know, maybe ready for its own, uh, a homegrown brand. Brands till then had been largely copies of Western brands. So you had a brand that was like a copy of the gap and you had another brand, but 
I, I really thought it'd be a good opportunity to build a, a homegrown brand. And, and that's really that journey of steering into retail um, and, and building a retail brand. And then later, you know, after building a retail brand, we also in the last 10 years, our effort has been to build a lifestyle brand. Uh, mm. which is why, you know, working with the farmers has been, you know, a part of the strategy with Organic India. And now, you know, we have the traditional foods, we have um, the craft products, um, which span from furniture now. Yeah, to that, that's what, what I was wanting to talk to you about also later, but you brought it up now, is the diversification that you did from handloom, diverting into a much wider world. But you know what, it's interesting since this is a fireside chat and not just me like a journalist firing questions to try and <laughs> trip you up or anything. I, it's interesting that your trajectory of thinking and mine though on at different times in different parts kind of match because I have found over these 40 years and more that I've worked, export is not for craftspeople. The export of the China variety of container load and the demands of thousands of meters of cloth, which all have to be exactly standardized, doesn't work for our sector. And is there a possibility that we can think of a million niche markets rather than one market taking a million of somebody's output? So that was, uh, I think, one thing that in the 90s when globalization came, the government pushed so much towards export. Our sector got neglected. And that is why, uh, just to fit that, kind of thinking in that I point out my setting up of Delhi Heart because when I said globalization, meaning opening up markets to foreign companies, why can't we open up markets for our own rural people, the other end? And that is how Delhi Heart came about and the craftspeople reached the marketplace. Because if the, if the foreign companies were looking at India's huge growing middle class who were out looking to shop, then the, the, the whole population of the USA at that time was less than our growing middle class. So we had a population here, they were seeking, why were we not seeking them? So that was how bringing Dilli Heart to the marketplace in urban areas became such a success because suddenly it was, uh, it was us offering something good of our own to our own people who were enough in number and had the money. And, and also, I'll, I'd like to move from this to something I didn't note particularly in the questions, but you know, what you are thinking and what we are doing in our own ways is very much Atmanirbhar Bharat, which is the big slogan of today. But don't you think that Atmanirbhar Bharat in the common understanding of the government means industrialization in India and not focusing more on craft and rural livelihoods? And how do people like you and me focus their, uh, their site to this sector and how much of Atmanirbhar Bharat and local produce should be sold local and then outwards rather than pitching out and pitching big to start with. So, so Jaya, I, I'm glad you brought up uh, the idea of Delhi Heart because I think uh, what you were able to do at that time was uh, create a kind of urban marketplace which um, needed needed to be done. I mean, otherwise, um, there was no way where people, craftsmen like that, especially small craftsmen, could find a market, could come in touch with urban consumers. And this was, of course, before the age of the Amazons and the Flipkarts of this world, where there was no access, there was no digital access. So you had to physically uh, create a space. And, and I think that for years, I mean, I don't know how many times I've been there, but anybody who would visit the country, I would take them there and show them as an example of what could be done. And, and I think that in that way, it, it really set a trend. And I'm glad to see that many state governments picked that up and they created their, Lucknow has one, I've been, uh, Bhuvaneshwar has a beautiful one, I mean, in the center. And, the, and, and these state governments also have access to the best real estate. So they've created, yes. you know, rather than putting it way out of town, they put it in the center of town. It's, it's a wonderful concept. And, you know, there are always some teething problems with who gets allocated a booth and all, but the, the fact that they exist is, is a huge testament to, you know, what good can come of something like this. Uh, you know, on a, on a broader issue, uh, Jay, I feel that 
there is a big civilization change taking place in the world. And, it, and I call it the pivot to Asia. Now, what's happened is when we all grew up, the West was considered to be the, everybody looked to the West. You know, and all the Western ideas were told, we were told that, you know, the Western idea is the best idea. So mm. whether it's the concept of GDP or we were told that, you know, willy nilly, every country must accept these ideas. And uh, they came out of a particular thought process, um, which is essentially very reductionist in, in its, in its, you know, if you look at it in the, in the philosophical level, it's a very reductionist thought process. What can be, um, only what can be proven beyond doubt matters. Everything else, it was a construct that came out of, you know, the period of what the Europeans call the period of enlightenment. But I think it's of an enlightenment of a particular kind. I, I don't think it's, it's really, it's true enlightenment, but all these economic theories, all these theories of social science, all these things that came up uh, in that period, then sort of because of colonialization and because of this feeling that people look to the West, um, for inspiration, these ideas actually took root all over the world. But, you know, and, and often in many countries, it replaced traditional thought systems, traditional systems of, you know, product, traditional systems of, you know, how countries preserve their individual heritage. And in a way, it sadly devalued many countries. It certainly did this in Africa. And in India. People were told that their traditions were meaningless that they had to be sort of westernized, they had to join this race. And, um, and you know, in, in a sense that this was a profound disservice that was done. You know, we lost confidence in ourselves totally, I believe, for some year, serious number of years. And then, even then, when things like yoga came back to India from the West, uh, people started talking about it and famous people started talking about Ayurveda and yoga, then people said, oh my God, this is something we have here. And, and I think that was a profound, that did a, a great disservice to traditional knowledge systems around the world. I mean, like your map, going back to the map you did, you captured the incredible richness of every state, of every district, of what existed. So my sense is that that, you know, blind faith in what came from abroad was, must be adopted. I think that period, fortunately, is coming to an end. And yes. I think there's a civilizational change taking place where many of these ideas have now been quite discredited and people are looking for indigenous solutions. People are looking for local solutions. They're going back to local knowledge systems. You know, I met a farmer recently who has phenomenal yields and he said, everything I was taught as a student in agricultural school, I've forgotten. I, I do a particular kind of farming. You know, the, the Japanese have rediscovered masters like Fukuoka, countries around the world are rediscovering their traditional knowledge systems and saying, you know, this one size fits all approach. Mm. This extreme reductionism is something we must move away from it. And I think that in that civilizational change, I think India can play the largest role because as a bank for biodiversity, for diversity of craft, of heritage, there's no single place in the planet that comes close to India in terms of the amount of uh, because of the unbroken history of the country stretching back so long, it has, it has in every field developed, you know, like today, every, I was reading something waxing eloquently about Amla, about, about the benefits of Amla, about, you know, so everything is being like, uh, there, there's this new herb that everybody's talking about. called Giloy, Giloy. Yeah, not Giloy, Andrographis panicolata, which is Kalmik. Actually, it's got. Achha, but Giloy is apparently Giloy is gone, awesome. everyone's gone crazy with Giloy, and that has the most sales. And people are realizing what was completely not even noticed is today what is keeping people COVID away from people. I'm only worried that these pharma companies won't come and patent the thing and put it in a capsule and feed the world with it, and give us back our Giloy with a huge profit. This is what one is always scared of, even with simple, lovely, nutritious products like ragi with the farmers. I used to buy it for five rupees a kilo from Karnataka and now it's altitude store, God knows, 50 rupees or something. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the point I wanted to make was that when you said a very important thing, this one size fits all. My worry and what I'm coming across and it came across a lot in GST uh, was that uh, there is still a corporate mentality 
that is in government systems, especially when they're digitizing now for transparency, a lot of good intentions, but it's, it's under a corporate technical system. So every one size fits all means that every artisan, small or big, like every farmer, small or big, has to fit into a pattern which can almost like fit on an Excel sheet. And the balance and your projections, it's all so much that the craftsperson, as you know, they don't even, can't even afford a chartered accountant to file a no GST form every month. So there's a worry that one size fits all while it isn't, while it's being disabused in the West, we are adopting it to, in fact, make it harder for our diversity to flourish. What do you think of that? Now, I think that um, I have a much more optimistic view of things here because I, I, I feel that with the coming of, of the digital revolution, um, many, I can see that uh, we have about, we deal with about say 2000 to 2500 micro enterprises. Um, and I can see that there is so much entrepreneurial ability there. Uh, and they have now access to markets. Uh, earlier, the only access to market would be, they would go to um, uh, the Lihar. Lihar or whatever, Lihar. exhibitions. You know, Suraj Kunda exhibitions. Now they have access through Amazon, through Flipkart, through Lion. I agree, very much so. Multiple points of access. And so, and they're in a way challenging larger brands like ours and saying, okay, if you don't innovate constantly, then, you know, your product, we will start selling the same thing at a lower price. So it's, in a way, it's great because it forces us to invest in design and innovate. And that design eventually percolates to a wider industry. And yes, but don't you think also, I mean, it is important to teach crafts people the skills that are associated with digitization. For instance, I remember doing two uh, workshops on teaching crafts people photography because they make a lovely thing in their home. They want to share it with their customers or say even you or me, they will send it on WhatsApp and it looks shabby, the presentation. So we showed them how to do a positioning, setting, perspective, light and dark and all of that. And it helps a lot for them to become more effective in their dealing with the digital world. Now, I, I, I wish and I could share, this is nice to share on this whole platform. It was just a random idea, but I'd like to share it with you if uh, Vipin doesn't mind. Is that this morning I thought the beautiful artworks that have, for instance, come out during COVID by all the traditional artists who did not feel uh, cowed down by this, but sat there and started doing wonderful paintings of marketplaces of gods, everybody wearing masks and putting sanitizers everywhere. And these paintings we got, we put it on, Instagram and Facebook, and we've done good sales for them, including masks of about eight lakhs in two months, which is big for us. And um, I had a thought, the uh, making a jigsaw puzzle, for instance, is simple with laser. And if you take a painting and put it on a jigsaw puzzle, create a jigsaw puzzle out of it of, uh, for different age groups, it would make a lovely way of children building a traditional art form and understanding it. Now that skill, you need a good fabricator. You need the finances to create it. How, how do people who are listening to us today or say you, if I have this idea and I have the craftspeople, how do we get together to create these lovely jigsaw puzzles, which would be wonderful to sell in every museum shop, in every bazaar and anywhere in the world on, on e-commerce. Now it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, it's, I, I want a solution for that, which is implementable and financially who would support it because we don't have the money. we survive on craftspeople's money actually, because they survive on our ideas. So, you know, I, I think that one great change that's been very positive is that there is a market for everything. Now you can go to Amazon and get chess sets made from, you know, by craftspeople that, so there is a market for everything and there's a market, these marketplaces, these websites are, are very egalitarian in a way because what sure. they do- Selling is they them is not a problem, making them, making them. The other thing, I'll come to the point of making them for a moment, but the other thing is that you mentioned GST. 
in my opinion the gst has leveled the playing field because the government has given exemptions to smaller producers and that has actually freed them and the larger people need to pay gst they are paying gst you made an unbroken chain for gst so you can't get the benefits of the input credits till you till you pay the till you charge gst from your customers agreed, agreed. i think in that way they have really made the tax system extremely efficient they've created you know one a one country one market theory and uh, for smaller people they've given for smaller producers for micro enterprises they've given an exemption which i think is great and I, i'm sure the government in its wisdom will raise the exemption limit every year so that as smaller producers uh, you know can get the benefit of of growing to a certain extent then becoming larger producers then coming under the gst and and so on so i think it's a very uh, it's a very well thought out policy and i think but uh, I, while i agree with you i feel that certain things need an understanding of the lowest in the rung of the ladder because um if you have somebody making and looms simple ones not everything for a fancy urban market and you put a 5% tax on that the person who is making a 4 lakh rupee zari finely woven silk brocade saree in banaras also pays 5% why should they not pay more according to the slab so anything above 10000 uh, cost you would pay a higher gst and the chota wala either pays nil up to a certain sale cost level or if it's anything up to 2000 rupees he pays only 5% gst something like that because otherwise again it becomes one size fits all and the chota wala gets squished actually j j if you look at gst uh, what it discourages is uh, price gouging because what happens is the the lower your markup the more your input credits can can give you um, can be taken into account so if i take something that's 80 and sell it for 100 and i pay gst on the 80 then the net addition of tax for me is very very small according to the gst rules but if i take something that is 20 and sell it for 100 then i'll have got the input credit only on 20 which is the cost of my raw materials and if i'm a designer and i've sold it for 100 which is a five times markup then i i will actually have the the incidence of tax will fall on me which is a very fair system it's a very progressive and it's a very fair system and so that for people who take the highest markups end up having the largest incidence of tax what it does um, wh what it's been doing now is that there has been a, a real explosion in the number of micro enterprises yes so you said that the country had maybe a million micro enterprises today i would say that number has safely pre covid it's grown many fold and micro enterprises are the engine of employment in it's called non it's called non formal um, urban employment but micro enterprises are actually the largest i would say employer uh you know in outside of agriculture and these micro enterprises have you know they the only my only desire would be for them to get better access to credit uh because that has been hard for them to do there have been a lot of new banks uh that have come into play that are actually focused on uh lending to this sector but i think that if there's more encouragement for priority sector lending by the rbi by the government they've already taken a lot of steps in What that about these mudra loans they could be quite handy for small producers you know i just i'll give you an example i i had lent money to a small producer and during the covid time they had returned the money and so i think as a credit risk small producers tend to be much more reliable than large companies absolutely yes uh, so i think that you know if that can be done i think it will it will really uh, no, but have you have you had any <clears throat> examples or experiences where pe people crafts people to supply to you for instance have needed to take a mudra loan for uh raw buying raw material and got it and supplied because of the mudra loan because i am very curious i ask bank managers all over the country and they say ma'am it's a good idea for the crafts people or anybody but we are not yet trained within to handle it right and i wonder whether it's improved because in the recent times i have not checked would you know anything about that no i don't have any data to support one i know that people had 
uh, a very difficult time because the cash cycle uh, virtually dried up in the first few months. And then after that, our effort has been to, you know, as quickly as possible, um, you know, take as much stock as we could and clear our suppliers outstanding as quickly as we could. I know that many of them struggled. I heard from many people who had struggled, but I also know that they did ultimately find access to credit. I mean, they got credit. Uh, usually it's from their communities um, and their local networks that they were able to leverage some debt. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that in that way, the sector is very resilient. I mean, Yes, and I found I found that calling them up every two or three days from the day of lockdown to ensure whether they were getting rations right up to the time where I was persuading them to make masks, send things, do whatever. Uh, they were the most positive. And in fact, if somebody's weaving unit had to shut down in whatever little workshop space or land or anything they had, they would laugh and say, oh, we've become temporarily farmers. We're planting these things. So our weavers are being told, plant uh, some sabji. At least you have that. <clears throat> and they were so supportive. Govardhan of uh, Telangana, whom you would know, Gajam Govardhan, is a very well-known ikat weaver. He actually called to say that he had supplied with his cloth uh, 50,000 masks to the local police force. And some the batik sari maker from Bengal gave his entire bank and railway station staff masks for free. Now they were doing that kind of thing, which was, I thought, so supportive and so nice. And they really are the most resilient of all sectors. And, and I think we need to build on that because unfortunately, I appreciate what you're saying because, and I find that all my friends who are working in businesses and companies and not doing seva kind of work alone but doing it through earning money and making profits and plowing that back are um, they don't like they're still in the mode of complaining whereas people like us actually see the positive side of things but maybe it comes from a syndrome of you know we always have to be anti-government whichever the government is kind of thing i don't know whether that is it or whether business models are the only answer to succeed eventually and all those people who are saying we are all crushed after demonetization crushed after gst crushed because of covid and we are all starving whether such voices how valid they are how they can be persuaded by their some of them ngo leaders some of them other kinds of leaders to understand this new world that you are talking about for instance how does one do that? Because that's very important to make people have faith in their own livelihoods and skills. So, you know, uh, Jay, I, I think that if you, if you ask about a government's role, I'm a firm believer that governments work best when they, when they look at the role of a facilitator. Um, and, you know, so there was a time in the country, and I know you were involved also with some of the state emporiums, and they came up. But there was a time when the idea was that government would run the retail front end. And after 1991 and the economic liberalization reforms, that idea, you know, people were not as enthusiastic about government pouring money into running businesses. I think that if government acts as a facilitator, there are probably three things it can do to give. And, and if they do these things, they could probably generate an additional 20 million jobs uh, because I, I've looked at some numbers and I think they can generate 20 million sustainable jobs, uh, which is an important number for the economy. But um, I think one is uh, work out a much more generous credit cycle. Uh, mm -hmm. Because even if you do support micro enterprises, firstly, their failure rate is very low. Secondly, if you, are, if you can, in a way, allow a certain amount of write-offs to take place, you will be... Um, you know, supporting a part of the economy that is, is that has very strong linkages to the rural area. And these linkages coupled with the multiplier effect that, you know, supporting micro enterprises in small places has will give you a tremendous benefit. The other thing is, I, I think that this is an idea that various ministries have uh, worked on at different times. Uh, the idea of uh, having distinctive marks. Now, the most successful mark is today, I, I would say one of the most successful marks is the mark for Darjeeling tea, 
you can't just call anything Darjeeling tea. It has to be grown in a particular way, come from a particular part. So either you have a geographical mark or you have a mark, uh, a process mark that has to do with genuine e-cut as opposed to screen printed. You know, so if you can set up a system where these marks are, are protected and people who use them, uh, they have to be genuine. Like in, in many parts of Europe today, you have different types of marks. You're not, for example, you could use the word champagne, parmesan yeah. cheese. That is part of the GI. You call it Parmesan. It has to go through a process. It has to be certified. So a similar system of mark, protected marks, if they could come Tell in. me, um, do you think yeah, over here I can... Okay, let me just okay. finish because I think that these these two are simple and only government can do this. Private you, enterprise. You gave three point, two point, three points. One was generous credit. Two was support to micro enterprise. Three was the mark system. Yeah. Anything nothing, else? Nothing else. I mean, if government were to, to do this, I think there would be an upsurge in in the you know in, in a real explosion in the number of micro enterprises and the vitality and the employment generation would be huge. And this is something that only government can do. A private enterprise cannot do this. Uh, mm. These are three areas where you know, it's it's. I've, I've always I'll just share a little idea with you. I've always wanted a E mark E standing for three things. The product must signify. One is E that it creates employment because of its very process and nature. The second E would stand for excellence. And the third would stand for eco-friendly. And I think eco, uh, this a very, very strong idea which India pushes out, should push to the world more, is the fact of using natural materials as we do so much in the craft sector as something that will help clean up the planet in a major way. And I think this, if we can bring the, this alphabet or mark in the form of an E into our products, it would make a difference. And the other thing was this whole fight that endlessly goes on between a reservation for handloom, which I've given up the idea, I don't think it's workable nor should be. Why can't we be more firm that you sell power loom along with your hand loom fine but put make one a, a, a p and the other an h just be honest i keep telling our craftspeople that don't fob off power loom as hand loom and the interesting thing that's happening which i heard in kanjivaram was that they now make power loom and wax it to give it its smell of hand loom poke holes on the edges so the cell wedge looks as if it's hand loom and then sell it for very much more, pretending it's handloom. Now, there are very strange things going on, but the fact is that we should honestly differentiate between the two rather than allow everyone to be cheated. You know, Ajay, that's where a mark is very useful because if, if a mark is well administered, a mark can be a very useful way of giving the consumer a sense that this is a genuine product. Like, for example, there's a lot of printed e-cut now that is flooding the market. If you have a mark, you can't call something e-cut unless it is a genuine e-cut product. So sure. I mean, these are easy things for uh, governments to do and only governments can do these things. So private enterprise can't administer them. You can't be a player and an umpire at the same time, but government can be the umpire. They can say that, see, then what happens is today when we sell genuine e-cut, we get a lot of customer pushback saying, we can buy the same product at 50% exactly. less. Why are you charging us so much? And then you have to say to them, look, this is genuine. That is not, they don't know the difference. And in your store, you try to publicize the process of the Indigo, for instance. I've noticed the, the kind of placards you put up, but. I mean, for example, if, if champagne wasn't protected, it wouldn't be a national asset of France. Everybody would make champagne. Everybody would be making it. And it's after all, you know, they'd be calling it champagne the customer wouldn't know. So you, by protecting something, you give tremendous value to the producers. And I think that that is important. Uh, but do you think governments, shouldn't they have a more transparent system? Because at the moment, it's by aborting or sabotaging the system that wrongdoing happens to such a large degree. Um, how can transparency be brought into this? I know you've talked about players who are non-government. That would probably also mean ICA's craft mark, but it's very limited. And I feel 
somehow it's not very egalitarian because you can't have a potter who sells mittika bartan on the street to walk in and ask for a craft mark but he's as much a genuine crafts person as somebody who's making fancy pottery and ceramic and can get a craft mark so um, government does not do that does not differentiate and it's as you say it has to be the umpire but how do you make that umpire have integrity and transparency you know for many years aika i think has done an amazing job i mean it is a trust it is done an amazing job of uh, protecting uh, and creating a craft mark it is now being you know customers are beginning to recognize that uh, and aika did it as a as a as a public trust i mean so it it does it as a public charitable trust and and it, and it does a very fine job uh, and i think the ministry of textiles has a hand to mark which is again you know uh, done a tremendous amount for raising awareness so right. there are examples of this um and i think that it is it is easy to do but the only challenge is we have so many different um traditions and heritages and and specialized ways of doing things that need to be protected that if you started creating marks you need a whole ministry to manage these marks because there are also knowledgeable people because the fellows who give the mark don't know anything very often but you know i i you know again i i beg to differ because when i have dealt with people you know i find them to be you know very dedicated by and large very knowledgeable they're very helpful i mean i've always uh, and in all these you know we used to we were service centers and places you find people who are real who spent their dedicated their lives to understanding that i i think that it and that is also part of the same you know government system uh, you take credit yes, for it perhaps perhaps uh, qualified master of bodies for instance as we were should come in to be the certifiers along with the government person because the new generation of government people who have not who are the old ones have retired and gone off they really don't know anything and they move from ministry to ministry so they don't become experts soon enough you know I, there are many ways to administer a mark and and i i am not expert an expert to be able to discuss it there are many ways to administer a mark and i think there is a way i mean people will I mean, but if you take the uh if you take the role of of um you know accelerating micro enterprises protecting traditions you know if you give credit you have a mark you have you have a support system for micro enterprises you know you you're then in a really really strong position if you if you're able to do that you're in a very strong position to create an ecosystem that allows these organizations to flourish right now these organizations have tremendous challenges when we can lend we can borrow money because we can get a crystal rating we can borrow money at a very low rate of interest many of them don't have the same benefits so i think that if you if you can level the playing field in that way it will be important to do um you know i think that in the future um as micro enterprises and as smaller producers get access to urban markets get access through uh these digital marketplaces um uh, i think that for more established companies like ours the challenge will be where do we go from here i mean what do we do how do we move beyond this and and you know to me our journey has been you know we started off as an exporter we became a retailer then we became um, a lifestyle brand and now our next transition will be to take uh, you know to to embrace a new kind of business which we which we're incubating right now and hopefully which will be a business of the future so in a way the cycle is so dynamic that as as many of the producers become retailers and you know there's thousands jail in the last few years there are thousands of excellent brands i mean you take a brand like um you know okai is a fabulous brand you take another brand like jaipur you take even manyavar has been a more recent brand it's it's established a name for itself so there are many home grown brands now and i yes. think it's great that there's this revenue yeah. of home grown brands today you don't have brands talking about being a copy of a foreign brand they are proudly home grown they, they stand for things yeah and what i'm what i'm happy to see is people who are much younger generation younger than you and of course very much younger than me they are business minded they are very go getting they are enterprising they are they don't they have not that seva bhav that 
our generation had. We did everything like Gandhians, never earned a penny in my life for the work I've done. But today they want to earn, they want to help. And so many more people are coming into the craft sector. When people say crafts are dying, I say it's quite the opposite. The number of letters I get every day saying, we want to intern, we want to work with you. There are new companies coming up on WhatsApp and Instagram. Every day you see something beautiful being created by young, bright, innovative minds. And people settle anywhere these days with a laptop, you can create a whole new world. So I am, I'm very hopeful for the craft sector actually, and looms and crafts. And, and I think COVID, I kept telling everybody through all this that probably they are the ones who are going to be the most resilient. And we have proof because overnight they didn't grumble, they didn't cry, they switched to doing something which was their skill. Uh, there a point I wanted to also, um, maybe we're coming to the close of our discussion, but some thoughts from you, is that craft, the word craft always brings to mind a product on a shelf or a, or a vastu of some sort. But the real meaning of the word craft is skill. And I think that craft today should be promoted more as available skills by a large number of people. And then work with professionals, whether it's building a company, whether it's running a website, whether it's doing the interiors of a, with an interior designer or now architects so much, they're turning to people like me saying, Co collaborate in the work. So I, I believe that it's skill application, which is, is something that will teach our artisans that there is a much wider world out there. It will make them innovative, not be stuck to their little contemporary char booty for border type of designs. And they will themselves create and become designers without going through the process of feeling that designers are superior to them. And, and uh, I, I believe that this some, is something that we should think of. And I would love to have you kind of pitch in in your own way. Nobody has to collaborate, but to offer skills in some way so that more people can use their work than us who are like craft oriented people selling or designing or whatever. Yes, I think uh, Jared, it's a, a very powerful idea and I think it's an idea whose time has come. Uh, I, I think it's one that, you know, um, I, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think the, the businesses that fail, though they blame other things, they fail because they fail to innovate. I think that today there hasn't been a better time to set up a micro enterprise, to set up any kind of enterprise. Uh, I think that, um, you know, I mean, this, this last year has been difficult because of the COVID conditions, but, you know, I think by next financial year, the economy will be back uh, on a very positive uh, note. And I'm, I think there isn't a better time to have gone into business. I remember when I went into business, how difficult it was and how much easier it is today. I know there's more competition, but there are also many more consumers and there are many more avenues by which you can reach consumers. And so, you are also very much more experienced. <laughs> experience is available quite easily today. I mean, there's some, you know, I, experience was actually in short supply when I started in retail because not many people had done retail in the country. Yeah, I know. Today, there are really excellent retail professionals. So uh, I feel that you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future. And I think the crafts people who are innovating, the micro enterprises, I can see, I remember going to places like Maheshwar where there was one unit, now there are 20 units, the 20 micro enterprises in that town, they're all doing amazing stuff. They're on Instagram. You know, I went to Bhuj recently. I, I realized there are 40 or 50 traditional producers in Bhuj itself in that immediate area. And then Tamarka is different. Ajakpur is different, you know. So it's, it's really it's an upsurge uh, today and it's fantastic. Uh, you know, and, and I, you know, partly it's because driven by the technologies that make it easier to access people uh, and tell stories and, and reach local audiences. And also I think there's a huge demographic and consumption change taking place that people are very proud to buy their own heritage, be it yes. in terms of- that is why in you mentioned the word story. I believe um, on a larger scale, humanity is made up of stories. Everything else is That's right. whatever. But, but with craft, when a story goes with craft, it becomes our own. And this is why I think if we put a story with every craft or craft skill, 
we can ne never need to fear imitation from any country because they may make it better than us, but they don't have the story to go with it. And today, I think the story, the humanity of things sells 50% of what the actual product is. So we need to also consolidate our stories. And I think Fab India does it. We tell little stories about craftspeople on our placards or brochures or on the walls. And uh, we enable craftspeople to come on video and tell their stories. Documentation, that's why even the craft maps, though they were not really stories, they were snippets of stories here and there, cultural stories. And I think storytelling is something India must never, never uh, do without. And we should celebrate that and bring it more into the craft sector because every craft has a story to tell, every one of them. Let's not miss out on that. And, you know, in closing, I think just, just as a follow-up to what you said, yeah, it, it's also, if you look at Italy and you look at Japan, there are two examples where in Italy still you can buy beautiful craft. Mm. In Japan, you can buy beautiful craft. And you Fantastic, yeah. But they also are masters of industrial products. So I'm not a believer that says an economy must industrialize and lose its tradition. No, you can do both. Yeah. I mean, Japan makes things industrially, as does Italy, which are of excellent quality. And uh, you, know, you can industrially make a Lamborghini car, but you can also make a leather belt in Italy, which is just superb quality or a handmade pair True. of shoes. But there is a little difference that, that they are smaller countries and the, what you are pointing out and which I agree 100% are excellent, are oases and we are an ocean. We have so many more of them. You have one Madhubani, they have five million fellows on Madhubani. It's like that. There are so many that we have to work with community projects, community numbers. And then, of course, there will be some who are excellent and some not so, but the not so also have a market among the not so wealthy, but the people who will then prefer that to something else. So I believe that India has so many layers of producers and buyers that we probably have the most varied market anywhere in the world within our own country. Yes, I agree, but uh, I don't, I, I don't know, you say Italy might be a small country, but it exports its product to the world and it's appreciated in the world. Japan Absolutely. again might be a small country, but it exports its product to the world. So yes, they do. In the same way, I mean, I think that brand India can be built into be a, being a brand for quality uh, and, you know, uh, uniqueness that very few, but no other country can match. And that's where having a mark again is helpful because it pushes the bar up for every producer. So, you only get access to the mark if your product is that genuine, if it's that genuine Seika in this case, since we've been discussing that. So, you know, I, I think that it is only a matter of time before the government does it because uh, the national wealth of every country lies in its particular skills and, and its particular indigenous industries. Italy has its own, France has its own, and we have more than the rest of the world put together. So if you mm -hmm. add all the industries of the rest of the world, you add it, <clears throat> it will equal or exceed that. So. My sense is it's only a matter of time. And when it gets done, I'm, I'm hoping that they put you on that panel, Jaya, because you will make sure that the marks are protected. I mean, I think <laughs> that would be, very, that would be my, my, my wish. <laughs> Not that we, all, we all should be there because we mean the best and we love our country and we are very positive. And I think the points that I brought out are points of others which are questions they ask and when we talk positive they think that somehow you know we're just seeing things through rosy colored glasses but I don't believe so and unless we are positive inside we won't make the world positive either. So that's a lovely note to end on and perhaps our uh, host will agree with us that maybe we end here and whoever has to sum up or do whatever the honors are can do so. I think Shruti come right back. Hi, Shruti. Thank you. It's been lovely speaking to you anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you, for this wonderful conversation and also bringing in both the global and the national perspective in the sector. And definitely the story would be inspiring for many young entrepreneurs who would want to come into the craft sector. Thank you once again for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jaya. Thank you.